Uh, welcome everyone to uh, Four Seasons of New Jersey Birding. Uh, my name is Kirsten Howe. I'm with Tucson Audubon. I'm excited uh, to have you all here today. Um, and I'm excited to introduce our, spe our speaker. Uh, Greg Kralich is a retired geneticist who was born and raised in New Jersey, currently dividing his time between New Jersey and Florida. He has been birding across the US and in Central and South America, but finds it difficult to leave his home state during migration. He volunteers by leading bird walks for the local county park system and at the Edwin B. Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge, and his photos from the basis for his website, birdquiz.net. Uh, we're really excited to have Greg with us today to talk about what it's like to bird in New Jersey for us Arizonans who uh, don't get the chance to see harlequin ducks and other such <laughs> cool birds on a daily basis. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Greg uh, and we can get started. Okay. Let's see if I can share this. Okay, you folks can see this. Yeah, we're seeing your desktop now. Oh, there's the slides. And turn that off. Okay, we're good. Looks great. Super. All right, so welcome everybody. Uh, it's a beautiful day here in New Jersey. Hope you're having a good one out there too, wherever you are. Um, and uh, today, for some of you may not know that this is kind of a two-part Zoom exchange program that we've got going, where last week, uh, Luke Safford from Tucson Audubon gave a presentation for our New Jersey uh, birding group, the Southern Ocean Birding Group. And today I get to return to favor by describing birding in New Jersey. Um, so the approach that I'm going to take is to go through the birds of New Jersey by seasons. Um, basically, the idea is if you've got a few days and you're visiting family or coming here on vacation in any one of the seasons, what are the birds that you might be seeing or targeting and where you might be seeing them? Okay, so, um, and the birds that I'm going to be talking about are primarily the ones that are not seen on any regular basis or have never been seen in Arizona, I'm trying to focus on the, the uh, unique birds. Okay, so let me start off with a little bit of background. Um, and let's start by comparing New Jersey with Pima County. So the thing that was interesting to me when I started um, looking this up is that New Jersey is actually smaller than your county, which just seems a little unfair that our state is smaller than your county, but that's the way that it is. Um, but despite that, we've got about a similar number of bird species. Um, let me just adjust something here on my screen. Okay. Yeah, we've got about the same number of bird species um, uh, as uh, recorded in eBird. Um, New Jersey is the 46th state in size or fifth smallest if you prefer that way, but it's actually the 14th in terms of the number of bird species. So that's kind of another way of saying that we're a compact but fairly bird species rich state. Um, Pima County has the advantage that it um, has the specialty species that are hard to see elsewhere in the country. Um, New Jersey has, uh, in contrast, the eastern warblers, shortbirds, uh, possibility of pelagic species that you don't get out there. Okay, whoops. Okay, so here's a map of New Jersey, uh, the geography of New Jersey. So I'm not a geographer, but I can tell you that the outer coastal plain where I live down here, hope you can see the pointer down here on the bottom of the state is a uh, region that has been underwater several times during its geographic history. So it's a very sandy region, uh, very low lying, um, poor, uh, poor nutrition content, very pine rich. Um, then as you get progressively towards the Northern end of the state, we get progressively uh, higher in elevation. Um, the, maybe from a birding perspective, these are the more important things, the uh, birding hotspots of New Jersey. And the one, that I th one place that I think most people have heard about is Cape May, which is here on the very Southern end of the state, the Southern Peninsula here. Um, and just the vibe, just the five, so I think it's a great place to go birding. Um, other places that you may not have heard about are these other places in red. 
Uh, Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge is one of the five national wildlife refuges in New Jersey, and by far is the one that's most heavily burdened. It's just about an hour north of Cape May. It's got uh, impoundments uh, in the eight mile drive that goes through a salt marsh. So it gives you great access to salt marsh and wetland birds without having to get out of your car even. And it also has an upland portion to it. So nice diversity there. The other place that in red that's really great year round is Sandy Hook, which is kind of the opposite of Cape May. It's a peninsula that sticks out of the, uh, sticks northward out of New Jersey, uh, six miles into the harbor. So you got ocean on one side, um, bay side on the other, and then a nice maritime forest for land birds. So those three places can be great any time of the year. Places like Forsyth and Sandy Hook in, in spring or fall, you know, getting 100 birds in one day is, is not unusual. Um, the other two places in black I'll tell you about later. Barnegat Inlet is a great place to go, especially in winter. High Point up here in the, high, in the uh, north is a place that we tend to go um, in the summer or early summer, kind of to extend our spring migration. Okay, um, this is the area where I live. This is uh, where Ocean County is. So it's kind of nicely located near some of these hot spots or a short drive away. Um, gives us great access to the ocean. So here's a cross section of the Cape May Peninsula. And I'm showing this um, kind of as an example of what we get all up and down the coast. As you start on the east, we have, of course, the Atlantic Ocean, and then we have the actual shoreline, and then a series of um, uh, barrier islands that you can see here. Uh, and then on the further, the western side of those islands, we have the bay side with associated uh, salt marsh, occasional islands, mud flats, um, sand flats, um, occasional uh, inlets, as you can see up here and over here. And then further west, we finally hit the uh, mainland and the, the wooded upland forest. So it's a great, I mean, this happens all up and down the coast. So it's really great because no matter where you are up and down the coast, you have access to all these different habitats within, within a very short distance. And that's what makes, I think, uh, birding here really great. Okay, so let's start going through the seasons. And um, so we're really just starting the spring, spring migration here, the, the kind of the hot time of spring migration. So um, what's happening in spring is, if you could imagine that we've gone back a month or two and we've just gone through winter, there's no leaves on the trees, um, uh, it's been cold, we've seen all of the winter birds that we expect to see and we're just waiting, waiting, waiting for neotropical migration to start again. And then uh, it's starting right about now, and then it'll peak around the second week of May. And so one of the first birds that really signals this beginning of spring is the bird shown here on this slide. That's an American woodcock. Um, woodcocks um, are shorebirds that happen to not be at the shore, really. They tend to be in the forested regions, as you can see here. And as soon as the ground is soft enough for them to go probing into the mud for worms, uh, they'll be around. You could even see snow on the ground here yet. And then right at the beginning of March, they'll start doing their mating displays. And if you've never seen the displays of the American woodcock, it's a treat. And um, so that's one of the big starts of spring for us, seeing woodcocks um, displaying. They kind of do this painting sound, and then they'll swirl up, upward, continuously upward, um, making sounds with their wings. And then when they reach the peak, they start doing all this chirping, erratic chirping, and then come back to ground and just keep doing it again. It's a fantastic show. Um, I tried to find a video of it, but it's hard to um, vid get videos because it happens right at dawn and dusk. But, um, you know, it's probably worthwhile to just look on YouTube and see if you could find that. Um, and then finally, um, towards the end of March, uh, we start seeing our first warblers coming up. Um, the first ones to arrive are species like the pine warbler here on the left and yellow-throated warbler on the right. And it is such a thrill when you start finally seeing birds that have color on them appearing again in the woods. Um, so this is the beginning of the uh, Eastern warbler migration. Here in New Jersey, we get um, 34 different species of warblers every year. Um, 
26 of those species breed here. Um, they don't all come at once. They come in kind of waves or stereotypical order with um, the shortest distance migrants, things like pine warblers and yellow-throated warblers leading the, uh, leading the parade, essentially. Um, some of the other warblers to come up next will be uh, these, these folks here. Uh, palm warblers are up here now. Um, prairie, prothonotary, these are all some of our early season warblers. Um, you notice that the species that we get here, a lot of them begin with a P beginning at the beginning of the year. Pine, palm, prairie, prothonotary, and northern parallel. And a lot of them uh, also have a lot of yellow on them, as you can see here. Um, as I said, not all of the species breed here in New Jersey. Palm warbler is an example of one that migrates straight through New Jersey and doesn't breed here. Um, prairie breeds all over the state. Prothonotary is one that uh, we see about halfway through the state. In fact, I saw one yesterday, so they're, they're here already. Um, not all, the, all of the warblers are yellow. This slide, I think, is an example of what I really love about uh, uh, spring warblering is the different variety of patterns and colors that you get. Reminds me when I was just starting to be birding and you know you would see a bird flitting around in the tree and try to make a mental note of where all the colors are and then go look it up in your field guide and try to match it. So here's a good example of the variety of colors that we see in patterns. Red start, black-throated blue, and worm-eating warblers all breed here within the state. Um, and towards the end of spring migration, we'll get uh, birds like magnolia warbler. I mean, just look at that bird. What a gorgeous pattern on it. Brilliant colors, a dark black striping. Um, it's one of those birds that you could identify um, easily when it's um, above you. You know, some of the birds, when you get the belly view, makes it really harder. But the magnolia warbler, you might be able to see half of its tail is white and half of its tail is black near the tip. So that's one that's actually easier to see from on bottom or easy to identify from on bottom. And finally, near the end of migration, we get species like these two on the right, the bay-breasted warbler and Cape May warbler. We don't get them in huge numbers, but boy, when you see one, it's one of those birds that just makes your day. Uh, just brilliant colors. They're also two of the species that just migrate completely through New Jersey. They don't breed here at all. Um, just super birds to see. Um, not all the things in the spring are uh, warblers, right? Here's the three of our vireos. Um, White-eyed vireo and red-eyed vireo are, are just abundant birds throughout the state. White-eyed vireo likes real dense tangles. Red-eyed vireo likes being kind of up towards the mid canopy to the higher elevations of um, the forest. And, you know, they're very vocal. Red-eyed vireo in the middle of summer, in the middle of the day, you'll hear them singing away. Uh, not so easy to see them. They tend to be relatively stationary compared to the warblers, but uh, real good birds to say. Uh, the yellow-throated vireo up on the top is one that we get um, more towards the northern parts of the state. Um, a little bit larger than the vireos are this group of birds, um, the tanagers and orioles. So, um, Boy, these are just so great to see. Even, even on the slide, I'm getting excited about seeing them. Uh, we've got uh, two orioles that we have here, the Baltimore oriole and the orchard oriole. Uh, the female orchard oriole is yellow. The male is kind of a brick red belly on it. Um, scarlet tanager just reminds me of the uh, vermilion flycatcher that you get out west with this brilliant, brilliant red that even seems to be more red because of the black on the wings. Just a super bird to see. Um, they tend to be up higher in the canopy and it's amazing how a bird that is that red becomes so hard to see, um, but uh, they manage. And um, I was lucky to get this bird uh, on a log feeding on some insects. Um, but yeah, if you, I mean, if you're seeing tanagers and orioles like this and, you know, blue grosbeaks beaks and indigo buntings and you're not getting excited, then I think you're in the wrong, uh, the wrong hobby. Um, these are just super birds. Okay, so that's a sample of what's happening in the woodlands, but uh, that's not where all the action is, right? Um, we've got that 100 miles or so of coastline, 
And uh, there's plenty of action down there. So these are some of the first birds that we get early in the spring. Uh, piping plovers arrive at uh, early March, American oyster catchers shortly after. Um, piping plover is a federally endangered species. Um, just a beautiful little bird. You can see how its, its feathers on its back tend to um, blend in very nicely with the dry sand of the beach. So they, they're kind of fairly well camouflaged that way for considering that they're out in the open. Um, you know, but the orange legs and the single breast band go across here. It's a cute little bird. American oyster catcher. Well, that's, that's probably our most recognizable shorebird of all. That bird can be 200 yards away on a salt marsh. And you see those solid brown, black and white pattern on the bird with a, it looks like it has a carrot stuck in its mouth with that bright orange bill. Um, very easy to identify. Uh, kind of a pleasure having a shorebird that's really easy to identify. Uh, one of the big um, events that we have here in New Jersey is the mating and um, breeding of horseshoe crabs in Delaware Bay. Delaware Bay has the largest breeding population of horseshoe crabs in the world. And when they're breeding, their eggs come floating out onto the shoreline and you can get masses of birds like you see here on the left. You know, on a real good day, that's pretty amazing to see. Um, so all of these birds are feeding on the horseshoe crab eggs. And one of the species that's particularly dependent upon them is the red knot, shown on the right. So red knot's easy to recognize in spring because it has this kind of peachy kind of salmon breast and face. Um, but it's a bird that's in danger, uh, at least uh, one of the subspecies, the subspecies that we get here in the east. Um, that's a bird that migrates in the winter. It spends its uh, spends its winter down on the southern end of Argentina, and then migrates all the way up to the Arctic, just making two stops. One in Mexico, and the second stop is in Delaware Bay, where they time their migration to feed on these horseshoe crab eggs. And if they don't get enough uh, nourishment from those horseshoe crab eggs, if they don't fatten up, they're not gonna make it up to the Arctic to breed. And uh, so they do a count every year on the, in Delaware Bay, and I, the numbers last year were really depressing. Their numbers last year were down 60% compared to the previous year. So that's not good to hear. And we certainly hope that they rebound this year, we'll see. Um, here's a more example. You know? question. Go back to the last page, the last one. Uh, and yeah, somebody I've asked seen. in chat, what was the largest bird over here that you're seeing? And I, I think it's the- uh, oh, The laughing gull here. Yeah. Do you want to identify a couple of those birds that are in that group? Um, we'll see some of them in, in slides coming up, but this is certainly a laughing gull right here. Um, this is a ruddy turnstone. We'll be on the next slide, one with the black breast. There's about a dozen of them scattered around. And um, we have dowagers here. Here, um, it's a little hard because some of these are out of focus. The smaller shorebirds are gonna be a little harder for me to identify because they're so close together, but probably combinations of um, semi-palmated sandpipers and um, uh, sandaling might be in there too. But it's a little hard to tell based on, because uh, they're not, uh, it's more, you know, the photo was more to show the concentration of the birds rather than get to specific species. So I hope that helps. Okay, so here, here we have this bird at least was in there, the ruddy turnstone, right? I mean, it's just a great example of how, you know, we get these great colored warblers and people tend to ignore the shorebirds this time of year, but these shorebirds can have just spectacular colors and patterns. Ruddy turnstone, very recognizable with this kind of harlequin appearance to it, the bright orange legs and this kind of short dagger-like bill right here. Beautiful bird. Um, the Dunlin is a numerous bird on the shore. Uh, in the spring, it's recognizable because it has this bright, or not bright, but uh, fairly large uh, belly patch here, the black patch. And on the back, it has a lot of rufous color in it. So this, used, this bird used to be called a rufous-backed sandpiper way back when. Uh, and from here, you can see why. When you see them in the fall, that name would make no sense whatsoever. Um, black belly plover is another very common uh, plover uh, shorebird around the shore. 
Um, doesn't have much in the way of color, but that pattern is just gorgeous. They're kind of speckling salt and pepper appearance on the back and the dark uh, undersides and cheek patch. Uh, very recognizable bird. Um, a few more uh, of our shorebirds. I meant to say that um, just to put the shorebirds in perspective, uh, it's the largest group of birds that we get here in New Jersey. There are a total of 55 shorebirds that have been seen here over the years. Um, 37 of them we see every year, um, but only six of them breed here. So that's in contrast to the warblers where the majority of the warblers actually still breed in New Jersey to some extent, whereas only six out of 37 annual shorebirds breed here. It's also a great group of birds if you look for um, uh, rarities, because there's a different 18 species of rarities have been seen here in the state. So um, it's, a, it's a large group of birds and one that we pay a lot of attention to. Um, so this is um, another one of the abundant birds. This is a sanderling here. Um, sanderling, again, we get, they overwinter in the state and they're just kind of relatively boring, just gray and white birds. Um, but look at the colors in the spring, spectacular, spectacular as any kind of a warbler. The other two uh, shorebirds shown here, the Wimbrel and the Stilt Sandpiper, they kind of take a different approach, more having uh, drab plumage that'll blend in when they're out in the breeding grounds. The Wimbrel's uh, recognizable because it's one of our largest shorebirds, and it also has this very long down curved bill that uh, none of the other Eastern um, shorebirds has. The bird on the right is Stilt Sandpiper. It's kind of a um, a member of the like, middle-sized uh, shorebird group. Um, it kind of thinks that it's a dowager, if that makes any sense. If you see dowagers out there in Arizona, uh, dowagers are have really long bills and feed with an up and down, very rapid up and down sewing machine kind of motion. And the stilt sandpipers do the same thing. They're a little bit smaller than, than the dowagers. They're smaller bills but they feed with that up and down uh, sewing machine kind of motion in the middle of a dowager flock. So they're kind of, it's like they're like dowager wannabe birds is a way to think of it. But they have this little bit of orange also on the face, barring on the belly. Uh, so slightly different plumage from the dowagers too. Um, so those are some examples of the shorebirds. So, um, so we're gonna move into spring. Finally, around towards the end of May, spring migration is over and it's time to transition to summer. And during this time of year, we start looking for the breeding birds, right? Looking for breeding behavior. And this will go from around the end of May to, uh, you know, into July. And so here we have a photo of a uh, chipping sparrow feeding a pretty big morsel to one of its young. So in spring, what a typical thing to do down here would be to head up to the northern part of the state. Um, one thing I forgot to mention earlier is that New Jersey is a state that goes, you know, it has a long north to south dimension to it. The northern part of the state is actually further north than Manhattan, whereas the southern part of the state, Cape May, if you were to move Cape May westward, the Cape May Lighthouse would be in Washington, D.C., right? So, New Jersey is extending from northward of New York to, to uh, Washington DC area. So um, after most of the spring migration is done, one thing we tend to do is go up to the northern parts of the state where it's hillier and get some species that we don't get uh, very much down here in the south or that if we miss them during migration. And two of the big target birds would be these, uh, these two here. Um, the cerulean warbler on the top is just a brilliant blue. Um, it's a little hard, you don't see that that much in this uh, photo because, uh, because of the lighting, but uh, there's not too many kind of all blue, blue birds. Uh, but these guys like being up in the canopy. They're the ones that'll really give you warbler neck uh, hanging up really high. Black Warburnian warbler is just a spectacular warbler to see. Um, again, he likes usually being up high in the trees, but that brilliant orange throat, the yellow on the face, uh, it just looks like it's lit from within. Um, I remember once there was a, a question somebody posed on one of the birding blogs in the middle of winter when nothing much was happening. 
and they asked people what their spark bird was, the one that got them interested in birding. And by far the Blackburnian war warbler was the number one bird listed in that, in that kind of question. Spectacular bird to see. Um, here's a bird that doesn't have much in the way of, uh, you know, uh, variety of color to it. This is an oven bird. Oven bird is a bird that looks kind of like a thrush with that uh, all over brown appearance, spotting on its breast. It tends to walk around on the ground a lot. And part of the reason is because that's where they breed, right? The oven birds build nests right on the ground. You can see the nest on the bottom here. And this is where they got their name. It looks like a little oven or a little bit of a cave that they build. And you can actually see a couple of the eggs inside the nest right here. All right, so they just build like a little oven out of the, the leaf litter and the, and the twigs on the ground, a oven bird. Very cool. So they breed pretty much all over the state. Um, so mentioning thrushes, um, here's two of them. Uh, wood thrush again, breeds all over the state. Veery is more common in the northern parts of the state. And, you know, seeing birds is always good, but when you're hearing a wood, wood thrush or any one of the thrushes, it really, uh, really makes the day. The, hearing them is almost better than seeing them. Uh, the wood thrush has kind of a yodeling sound that it makes. And if you can hear this, this is what it sounds like. It's a gorgeous sound. Back in my old house, we used to just wake up to that and go to sleep hearing wood thrushes in the morning and night. The viri has a different kind of a sound. It's kind of a whirling, swirling sound where it's actually singing in harmony with itself due to its, the structure of its syrinx, kind of a haunting sound. So I'll play that here. Hope you can hear it. It's such a cool sound. So those are two of our thrushes. Um, the fly catchers, um, you know, we have our share of them. Most of them are fairly drab colored, so I'm not going to be showing them in this presentation. Some of them, you even have to hear them singing to know the difference between them. But two of the more common ones are right here. Uh, the eastern kingbird is up on the, on the right, kind of a charcoal gray upper sides and white on the bottom with the white right at the tip of the tail over here. Makes it very easy to recognize them. They love hanging around wet areas. The great crested flycatcher is the, uh, the only representative of the Myarchus group of flycatchers. Um, a large flycatcher with a bright yellow belly, rufous on the wings and also on the tail. Uh, yeah, another abundant bird or common bird in any of the woodlands. Whoops. Whoop, 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 one more. What happened there? Go back. Okay, I think we're set again. So woodpeckers, here's three of our woodpeckers. Um, Red-bellied woodpecker on the left is very common. We'll get them at feeders. Um, I know it doesn't have a red belly, but I'm not the person who named it, so don't blame me. Um, I know there's many people and non-birders tell me that they saw a woodpecker, a red-headed woodpecker at their, at their feeder. And I know that they're not talking about the real red-headed woodpecker. It's usually about the red-bellied here. Uh, red-headed woodpecker is a, uh, breeds also over the state, just a gorgeous bird though. Um, you know, these birds that have real solid patterns like this all red head, solid black and then white on the wings and the belly makes for a real nice combination. Um, and that's why this one is not a red-headed woodpecker. Um, pileated woodpecker is, uh, breeds more in the northern parts of the state. It's the largest woodpecker in North America, depending on whether you believe if the uh, ivory-billed woodpecker is still around. Um, they like breeding in really mature forests, so the northern part of the state is really good for them. Although we get them all the way down to Cape May too in smaller numbers. Um, again, not all the action is happening in the woods. Down in the marshes and on the beaches, there's plenty happening. Um, the breeding of the wading birds is, uh, can be really super. There's a place called the Ocean City Visitor Center, just a little bit south of Atlantic City where there's a big 
um, breeding rookery that has black crown night herons, yellow crown night herons, little blues, tricolors, um, snowy egrets, great egrets, all of them can be breeding in there. Um, so these are some of those, the yellow crown night herons and little blues. Um, it's a really great plant. Photographers love this place uh, because it's so accessible. You just park your car next to the visitor center and there's a ramp right at eye level with the, um, with the nesting activity. So just a great place to stop by and follow them through the year and see how the nesting is going. Um, two other birds that'll be nesting there are these two ibises, the glossy ibis and white ibis. Glossy looks an awful lot like your uh, white-faced uh, ibis that you get out west, except it doesn't have the red around the face over here. Um, they've been nesting in New Jersey since the 50s, but the white ibis is a different story. White ibis just um, you know, four years ago would have been on the um, review list, the, the rare bird list for the records committee. So if you saw white ibis, the New Jersey record committee wanted to know about it because it was that rare. Then two years ago, they started breeding in New Jersey at that Ocean County Rookery for the first time. And last year, I think I heard that there were something like 50 nests in there. So they have come in and they've come in in a big way. So it'll be very interesting to follow, um, you know, whether their breeding spreads further north, whether they'll be breeding in other islands in New Jersey, and um, how their breeding is going to affect uh, the other birds that breed there too. So it'll be very interesting to follow that up. But it's no longer a rare bird in New Jersey. Um, out in the marshes at a place like Forsyth, where you can take that wildlife drive, these would be some of the birds you would hope to see there. Seaside sparrow is a relatively drab sparrow, doesn't have all that much color, um, but it's kind of the voice of one of the voices of the salt marsh. Seaside sparrows and clapper rails and um, marsh runs kind of a, formed a backdrop for the sounds out there. And speaking of clapper rails, here's one on the lower right. Um, anytime driving around the uh, Forsyth uh, Wildlife Drive, uh, in summer, I'd expect to see clapper rail or two, especially going when the um, tide is out, they'll be out on the mud flats. Um, the salt marsh sparrow is a relative of the seaside, but uh, he's more colorful um, uh, in smaller numbers and uh, harder to see. They're more of a skulky bird. Uh, it's kind of like the, you know, like the pretty birds hiding because they know they're so good looking. Um, uh, this part of summer is a, is a great time to see terns. I'm a big fan of terns. Um, uh, so here on this slide, we have some of the more common breeders here. The Forster's tern and the common tern are probably the two most common species. They look quite a bit like each other. There's a great photo where we can see the two side by side. So the Forster's tern has kind of a bright orange bill and legs. Its legs are relatively short. The Forster's turn has a light orange bill and longer legs. So that's kind of a classic um, challenge to identify these two turns. It's easy when they're kind of right next to each other like this, but if they're not, if they're separated from their relatives, it could be awfully hard. You know, the color of the bill changes quite a bit when they turn and it gets different lighting. So um, great fun to see them. Uh, least terns, as you can see here, breed in the state. Um, least terns are, you know, part of that beach nesting collection that includes things like uh, the piping plovers and oyster catchers and black skimmers and common terns. Uh, there'll be colonies with different numbers of those kinds of species all together breeding on the beach. Uh, it's the smallest tern in the world. Um, very ag aggressive. You know, if you're near them, you know, they'll come zipping around your head. Um, so the neat thing about looking for terns for me is that, you know, there's a relatively small number of species that we get here. There's only um, 10 terns that are common in New Jersey during the, that we get every year. And, you know, with terns or shorebirds or gulls, kind of the, the neat thing is that they're out in the open. So there's all these birds out in the, on the sand flat. And, you know, the challenge is trying to sort through the really common ones to find the ones that are a little bit less common. And that's kind of a neat challenge for, uh, for any kind of a birder, I think. 
So that's why I like terns. The other thing is that they have good, be interesting behaviors. You know, some of these terns are plunge divers. So they'll plunge dive into the water for their food. And then when they come up, they'll bring it to the family members and you get this begging behavior like you see on this royal tern here on the upper right. Uh, really interesting to see that. So royal terns, as far as I know, don't breed here in the state. The place that they breed closest to us is in the Chesapeake Bay region. And then after they're done breeding, they disperse out and that's when we get them kind of towards middle to late summer and, and really good numbers. Uh, Caspian terns are the largest terns in the world. Um, they'll breed here and you can see them at Forsyth uh, pretty much on any drive during the summer. This one, I like this photo because this is a juvenile Caspian tern, which I really don't see that often. Just really nice patterning on its wings. These are all adults around except for this one here with the light orange. That's a that's a royal tern hiding within the Caspians, just a little bit smaller. Um, okay, and then there's, you know, terns that are uh, less common than that, but we still see them annually. And one of them is uh, here on the left. This is a roseate tern. Roseate tern is very all white, kind of a bleached out bird. But he has a long, narrow, pointed, all black bill, at least during part of this season. And you know, anytime you see a bird that has jewelry on its legs, you know that's going to be a good one. And uh, so Rosia tern is a one that's, I think, threatened species as its designation. But we benefit from them because uh, the second largest breeding colony of Rosia terns in the Northern Hemisphere is just off of the coast of Long Island. So we get them either when they're dispersing out or when they're migrating uh, back and forth towards that breeding location. So it's fun to look for them in the middle of the other turns. The gold bill turn here on the right breeds here in the state, but he's got the opposite kind of a bill. Instead of a long, narrow bill, he's got a shorter, blunter one, which gives him his name, gold bill turn. So they'll breed right here and seeing them at four sizes, kind of normal during the summer. And then we also look for something like a black turn, which is probably more common out west in the early summer, midsummer, when if we get to see them. They'll have this all black appearance, just a super bird. Um, later on, they'll lose most of that black plumage, which is when we tend to see them more towards the end of fall. Um, the gold bill turn and the black turn are uh, two of the turns that don't plunge dive. Right? They actually kind of swoop to the surface of the water and will just pick something off of it, or they'll swoop into the salt marsh and pick an insect off of the salt marsh grasses, things like that. So you can identify them partially by their behavior too. Uh, now this has to be a photographer's dream bird, the black skimmer. So the black skimmer, whether it's flying like this, and you could see these two different length mandibles, just a super bird to see. It'll lower that lower mandible and then just skim the surface of the water until it hits a fish and then it'll close and feed on it. Um, this photo was taken by Forsyth. That's a great place to see them because they feed in the channels right next to the wildlife drive during the summer. Uh, when they're breeding, they kind of lay out in this, this position just like they're exhausted. You know, it doesn't have that kind of an exhausted look to it. Like, a, like he's has no energy to do anything. Um, you know, here on the right, once they have the chicks, then you get this kind of activity with uh, the parents uh, bringing them food. And uh, like I said, this is just a photographer's dream bird, I think. Whoops. Okay, so finally, swoop, spring is, or summer is ending and it's time for fall is coming in. And, you know, I used to not go birding in the fall, but fall is just a super time. There's so much activity. Uh, number one, because birds have just bred, so there's all that, that many more birds that come through. They're not as colorful, not singing, but uh, there's a lot of birds around. Um, so this time of year, um, we have raptor migration, the shorebirds are coming through. Um, the ducks start coming back from their breeding grounds north of us, and they're going to come in winter in the state. Uh, and then it's a time for us here in the east to start looking for the western vagrants. So I'm not going to tell you about the Western vagrants, of course, because that's what you get over there. So it's a great time to see all of these kinds of birds. And probably the go-to place in the fall is the Cape May Hawk Watch. 
which is right on the southern shore of the Cape May Peninsula. This is a photo of the Hawk Watch here. It goes from September 1st to November 30th. Um, there's a paid uh, Hawk Watcher that stays right here in the corner of the upper section. Uh, it's fairly large, it's about 30 yards across. That's my estimate. Um, and uh, just a super place to be. Um, let me go to the next slide where there's a, a list of all of the species. So we get 16 species of raptors here um, on a regular basis, along with occasional rarities. Um, as far as I can tell, the species here are the same ones that you get out west. So I'm not really going to describe them in any great length, but just you can look at the numbers there and compare what we get in Cape May to what you might get out where you are. Um, the Hawk Watch has been going there on, has been going on since uh, 1976. That's when it started. So it's in its 40, what, sixth year, 46th year now. Um, but it's just a super place, not just for hawks, but for any kind of diversity, right? The, um, uh, there's something called a big sit, the trying to identify the most birds from a single location. And uh, I think it was last year in October, there were 146 species seen from the hawk watch in one day. Okay, not moving from that platform at all, 146 species coming through. It's a great place. So the hawks are coming right above you. Basically, they're flying south and then they see Delaware Bay and they're trying to figure out whether they should continue onward or not. So they sometimes circle around. Um, you're right on the edge. You could overlook the Atlantic Ocean. Um, there's a pond right in front. There's trails. So there's all kinds of bird activity here. Just a super place to be in the fall. Um, ah, fall warblers. So here's... I think I mentioned that I used to not go birding much in the fall. And the, part of the reason is because of these photos, these pages from the Peterson Field Guide, which I started out with, the confusing fall warblers. So I figured if Roger Torrey Peterson is confused by them, I'm gonna have no hope. So I kind of gave up trying even, um, but now I do it and I love it. It's a lot of fun. It is a challenge, but, um, it's fun. So here, here's kind of the classic problematic species in the fall. They look the same at first glance, but they're different species. And one of them we've seen before. The one on top is a bay-breasted warbler. So here's what it looks like in the spring. Here's what it looks like in the fall. Practically unrecognizable compared to what it looks like in the spring. You might be able to see just a little bit of bay colored residual here on the side of its chest. The one on the bottom is a black pole warbler, which we haven't seen yet. Um, it's a bird with a black cap, black and white uh, streaks going down. And one of the ways you can distinguish these two birds in the fall is because of the color of the legs. Right? The black pole warbler has kind of yellowish orange legs, which you can see here compared to the dark gray of the uh, chestnut sided. Um, you know, gradually you kind of can identify them quickly even without seeing the legs. But that's kind of a classic challenge of full warbling. Um, another one that's really different in spring versus fall is this one, the chestnut-sided warbler. You know, just a gorgeous, very dramatically marked bird in spring. And then in fall, it just looks very different. Right? The most noticeable thing, I think, is this overall yellow color and bright eye ring, which you don't really even see in the spring. Now you can see a little bit of the chestnut side on them right here too. Okay. But in fact, you know, those birds that look dramatically different from spring to fall, they're, they're kind of the, the small subset of them. Most of the fall warblers look essentially the way they do in spring, but kind of muted version of it. And a good example of that is shown here on the bottom. So here's the Cape May warbler that we saw earlier, um, kind of bright yellow breast, with uh, pencil thin streaks going on it, yellow face, orange by the eye. And here's the same species in the fall, right? It's the same pattern, the yellow breast, the pencil thin streaking, the yellow on the cheek, it just lost the orange by the eye. So it's kind of a bleached out muted version. And that's really what most of the warblers in fall are like that. There's even some that look completely the same in spring and fall, things like the uh, 
water thrushes and black-throated blue warbler. They're exactly the same in spring and fall. So anyway, it's a lot of fun going out and trying to uh, identify these warblers in the fall. But you know, I like going out to the beaches and this is a part of the reason why. I mean, this is a beach just a little bit north of Atlantic City that I like going to in the fall and you can see why. There's just birds all over the place on this beach. Um, shorebirds, gulls, uh, just you can walk right among them. Just a super, I mean, this is like a dream walking through this kind of a birdscape. And this wasn't just this part of the beach, this went on for two miles. Uh, just a super, super kind of fall birding. So here's some of those um, shorebirds that we saw in spring, right? The ruddy turnstone, red knot, black belly plover, and sandaling. Beautiful spring plumage. And then here's what they look like in the fall. Uh, basically, they're all kind of shades of gray, white, a little bit of black. Um, so that's kind of the challenge in a, in a nutshell of fall birding here. What you have to do is instead of relying on the color patterns that you see in the spring, you rely on the shape and the structure of the birds, as we see here. All right, and all of these birds would be recognizable or identifiable um, once you get a little bit of experience in the fall. But um, so that's kind of, you can imagine if there's you know, dozens of different species interspersed with each other, like this, these different colors of gray, uh, different shades of gray, I mean, can be a, can be a challenge. But you know, the thing that I like about uh, things like shorebirds and gulls and terns is that they're all out in the open. You can see them. It's just, do you have the uh, ability to distinguish what they are, you know, to identify them? And, you know, that's, that's fun. So here's some, I, I'm not gonna go through all of the shorebirds. That's a, kind of a separate program in itself. But here's a few of the ones that we kind of look for. The semi-palmated plover is the same, both in spring and fall. Um, Overall, it's a lot like a piping plover. You know, it has the orange legs and a single breast band. But whereas, if you can remember back, the piping plover had um, just the color of uh, beach sand, this whitish beach sand. The semi palmated plover has a color that looks like a wet mud on its back. Uh, very, very common species out here. These other three are more typical of, um, you know, the a little more on the rare side. Um, or less common, I should say. They're not real rarities. The marble godwit is a uh, the largest shorebird in New Jersey, um, so it's recognizable just by its size. But it also has this really long, slightly upcurved, bicolored bill that uh, makes it immediately uh, obvious what it is. Um, these birds here, American golden plovers, uh, they look a lot like. Um, black belly plovers, um, to some, well, to some extent. One way that you could distinguish them is by this really dark cap that they have that's offset by a really white supercilium. So it really offsets the dark cap. And then if you look closer, you could see some golden color on the back over here. Um, so anytime we get a, a good flock of black belly plovers, we look for these guys mixed in them. And they could be on the actual beaches, they could be in the mud flats, they could be on on sod farms, um, they could be kind of anywhere. A good place to go for them would be Sandy Hook late in the fall. That's a place where you might also see this guy here, buff-breasted sandpiper. Um, this, this species likes sod farms, although it's clearly not on a sod farm here. This was taken at Forsyth. Um, just an elegant looking, uh, beautiful buff-colored bird overall, gorgeous. Okay, so finally, all of the action is uh, winding down in late fall. Um, you know, the woodlands is starting to get empty, and what we do typically is to turn our attention over to the water. Um, that's where most of the action is happening. So we'll be looking for things like the waterfowl returning, look for alcids, some of the more unusual gulls, and this goes from, say, mid-December all the way through to March. Uh, so here we have a photo of uh, scoters. Uh, we have three species of scoters here in New Jersey. This, these ones with the orange bill are black scoters. Uh, most of them in this photo are blacks. But then the one, for example, leading the flock here on the left is a surf scoter with this kind of candy corn bill and a white neck on it. 
Uh, so black and surf scoters, and then white winged scoters are the third one that we get, a little less common than these two. Um, great place to go for winter birding is Barnegat uh, Inlet that I described on that New Jersey map. So this is what the Barnegat uh, Lighthouse Jetty looks like. So if you could imagine the from this photo, uh, the behind our back would be the Atlantic Ocean. On the right side here, this is the inlet. The inlet's about a quarter mile across. So if we start by the lighthouse, which is where the parking lot is, you walk on a paved walkway for about 300 yards. And after that, either you walk on the rocks of the jetty or you just hop onto the sand like I do now and walk all the way towards the ocean. And there's lots of great birds. Well, there's like a subset, I should say, of uh, real good target birds to see here. It brings in the photographers quite a bit. And right at the top of the list are these guys here, the harlequin ducks. I mean, it, it's hard to uh, find a duck that would be more colorful, more patterned than this one here. Maybe the wood duck is the only challenger. Um, but we get uh, harlequin ducks right, on the, right next to the jetty. They love the fast water. They leave, like being right next to the jetty. So you can get photos like this of harlequins with a cell phone sometimes. Um, I'd say over the winter, there's probably a flock of anywhere from, uh, I don't know, I'd see a dozen to maybe two or three dozen on a typical winter walk out there. Uh, another species that's uh, great to see over there is long-tailed ducks. A uh, small duck, the male has this really long tail, as you can see here. Um, you can see them up and down the coast, though. They're uh, anywhere along the shoreline. They like feeding right near the waves. but you know, going in early spring, like around March or so to the jetty, there might be hundreds of these, these ducks right along the jetty too. Super. Um, other uh, target species here would be the bird on the left is a great cormorant. Uh, great cormorants hang out on the channel marker right at the end of the jetty, has this white uh, cheek patch and then a white patch on its hip that's really easy to see when it's flying. And of course, it's a little bit bigger than the double-crested cormorants. Um, so they're always out there. Another bird that spends the winter over there is the purple sandpiper, all right? It's a shorebird that we get only during the winter, comes down and feeds right on the, right on the water line on the jetty. Uh, cute little bird, doesn't have much purple in it. You actually see a little bit here. This is probably very late in the spring when I took this photo. Another bird that you could see there is the snow buntings. Beautiful white birds, um, usually in a flock. Uh, you can find them anywhere on the uh, shore, anywhere on the shoreline. Um, flocks can be from you know three or four all the way up to hundred. Um, just a pretty pretty bird to see. It's amazing that they're feeding in the sand. You have, don't have no idea what they're actually feeding on and what food they get there, but you know they're right on the beach, right in the middle of winter. Um, at the end of the jetty, we'll have a flock of these uh, common eiders out there. Uh, this is the male on the left, female on the right. Uh, there might be a hundred or so out there, typically on a winter day, uh, often with a, uh, a single king eider mixed in there somewhere. So that's what we hope for. Um, we get about seven species, I think, of alcids here in New Jersey. By far, the one that's most common from shoreline are the razorbills. Um, so here's a pair of razor bills. Uh, we had a good year for them over here out on the jetties. Um, always great to see alcids from shore. Um, you know, two years ago, we had dove geese in in really good numbers. Occasionally, we get uh, things like thick-billed murres, uh, but not in any kind of numbers. Razor bills are by far most common. <coughs> um, two species of loons are very common over here, the common loon. Uh, it's kind of has this big bulky head, this, this forehead being very prominent on it, um, holding its bill horizontal. And then the red-throated loon um, is about two-thirds the size of a common loon, a much more sleek, elegant kind of looking, and almost always has its bill angled up, just the way you see in this photo here. Um, so these these will be all up and down the coast, but Barney gets a good place to see them as anywhere. And then finally, the uh, bird that everybody wants to see along the shore, uh, the snowy owl. Um, we, uh, 
whether you're a birder or not, <laughs> everybody wants to see snowy owls. Uh, so these photos were taken by Sue, who's actually on this uh, call. Um, so there is always a small number of snowy owls, uh, mostly hiding out in the state, state park or refuge areas. Um, in the winter of 2013, 2014, we had them in every county in New Jersey that year. There was a big uh, influx of them, but that's unusual. Uh, more common to have just a few of them scattered along the shore. Uh, you know, just an amazing bird to see. It's a, it just does things to people when there's snowy owls around. So, um, so those once you've seen uh, all of these birds in winter, basically, uh, you know, by that time it's around March, and we're waiting for spring to come around again. And you know, pretty soon the woodcock will be coming out, and the ospreys will be returning, and the tree sparrows, and we start the whole cycle all over again. So that's our seasons of birding in New Jersey. And I'll just say thank you. I'll be happy to answer any kind of questions we've got. Uh, I don't know if I go to the chat to do that or how this works. Let's see. Thank you so much, Greg. That was fantastic. Um, I love the perspective of uh, looking at the whole year through the seasons. And it's just such a fabulous way to pay attention to phenology, you know, the, the timing of different national natural phenomenon as you go throughout the year. And um, birds are just the best way to notice that. Um, we, uh, I did want to say before we turn to questions, uh, if anyone's interested, um, I did put a link to our nature shop. We have the ABA guide for New Jersey birding. So if anyone's interested in learning more about these birds, uh, or even taking a trip to New Jersey to see them, um, which I can't imagine anyone here doesn't want to do after that presentation, um, you know, definitely check out that book uh, and you can purchase it through our nature shop. Um, there was at least one question in the chat that uh, we didn't get a chance to cover, um, which is Annis from Oregon is wondering what kind of temperature variation do you have in New Jersey season to season? Geez, well, in the, in the summer, it, it can get into the mid nineties, that's another reason for heading to the shoreline, you know, do some birding in the morning and then go jump in the, jump in the water uh, or go swimming in the bay is what I do. Um, so mid nineties in the kind of peak of summer, down in winter it can get, you know, low teen, teens would be kind of a normal, uh, getting down, that would probably be the lowest we get in an average winter. Um, so, that, that's kind of the maximum and minimum here in here in Jersey. Yeah, it's a pretty drastic difference, which of course yeah. <laughs> um, makes sense why you know birds migrate in and out. Um, and if I can just build on that a little bit, you know, I've I've grew up in New Jersey and you know was burning here for many years, and lately I've been going to Florida, and you know it's great to go to a different place, go to Florida, mm -hmm. and you see all these kind of rare birds down there that we don't get in New Jersey. But the birds don't change that much from season to season, I found. You know, a checklist in, in spring and summer and fall is about the same in Florida to me. There's very small variation. Whereas in New Jersey, the, you know, because of that temperature variation that, that we just talked about, birding in winter and birding in summer, are complete, it's like being in two different places without having gone anywhere. So it's really fantastic. I've grown to appreciate it more when I've gone out of state and then come back to this New Jersey. Absolutely. It makes it really kind of exciting too when they return, you know, like old friends coming back and it's been a whole year since you've gotten to see them. Exactly. Um, yeah, I love that. That's awesome. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? Um, you're welcome to put your questions in the chat and I can read them or um, you can unmute yourself and ask out loud. There. Hard to believe there are no questions. <laughs> there was, you know, so many birds you talked about. Yeah, maybe a little overwhelming, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe everyone will have questions in <laughs> two hours from now. <laughs> it's always hard. Well, it's always hard to make up a presentation like this because you're not sure what the audience is. If people have been to New Jersey and seen these birds before, or whether they would be planning a trip to a place like this. Um, you know, Absolutely. So it makes it hard to decide what to leave in and what to leave out. Well, I know I'm super excited that I'm going to get to travel to the East Coast this summer and 
uh, hopefully see some of these birds and um, some of my favorite old friends like the uh, the wood thrush. Um, I got very nostalgic when you played that call as that was definitely a sound of my summer um, growing up on the East Coast. So <laughs> that was awesome. Um, okay, well, if there's no other questions, then I just want to say a huge thanks again to Greg for this presentation, um, for the, the Southern Ocean Burning Group for partnering with us um, to kind of get a little bit of a, a cross group uh, presentation so we can each experience each other's regional birds um, and maybe inspire some travel. Uh, so thank you so much to all to the audience as well, all of you for joining us today. Um, uh, this recording will be available. I'll upload it to YouTube and, and either send up the link today or tomorrow. Um, so be on the lookout for that and uh, have a wonderful rest of the day. And just thank you again. And um, we hope to see you back here again for another Tucson Audubon program. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Enjoy thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.